what will be the place and time of supply under GST? So let's begin our second technical session on GST implement implications on construction and place and time of supply. Rahul Patel to escort speaker advocate Roman Shah with CA Amish Kamdar and CA Rajiv Ramani. Now I would request CA Rohan Patel to give a brief introduction of advocate Sri Rohan Shah. Eminent faculty of uh, condensation, dignities on the dais and off the dais and my fellow friends. He has been considered as an expert in advisory, policy and controversial issues. And sir, I am sure uh, the GST would have all of them. Uh, Mr. Shah has been uh, appointed uh, as a member of the expert committee formed by uh, Indian Ministry of Finance and the Ministry of Commerce on issues related to the introduction of presumptive taxation for the gems and jewellery sector. He was also a member of the negotiating team deputed by Ministry of Commerce at the WTO Ministerial Conference at Seattle in 1999. Friends, he has been recognized as a lawyer or an expert lawyer by Asia Pacific Legal Finance Chambers, Asia Pacific, Asia Law uh, Leading Lawyers, International Taxation Review and Who's Who Legal. With this introduction, I would request uh, Mr. Shah to please uh, take the charge of the dais. And I request all of you to please welcome to the big, big round of applause. I would request CA Amish Khandar to felicitate Sri Rohan Shah with a bouquet and a memento. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for this opportunity to speak to all of you on the issue which is, I think, engaging the mind of all of India in terms of the politicians, the industry, and the whole community of consultants. Thank you very much again for the unprecedented gesture. Uh, many of you don't know, but the most important part of my CV is that I married a girl from Ahmedabad. Uh, and I am so pleasantly surprised that even before I spoke, I got a memento. Because I would have thought that at least in this city, Unless I deserve to get a memento, I would have been given. Uh, thank you so much for this generosity and I will always remember it and carry it with me. Uh, the key issue in terms of GST is A, we have to understand that GST is a transition unlike any that we've made in the 69 years since we've been independent. It is the only change that is going to involve the entirety of the commercial community in the country. And when we talk of that, we're really talking of close to 1.6 crore businesses which are estimated to migrate into the GST. Now, as we talk of the structure of that GST, therefore, we have to understand that what you hear today is ultimately about a law in transition. This is not the last word on GST. The law on GST is emerging. You have every role to play in the law as it emerges. Each of you have an opportunity to participate in this. And therefore, what interaction we have today is really a sharing of thoughts of something which is still being evolved. And as it is, as it is getting evolved, the issue is not in terms of, you know, how is this going to impact my business? How is it going to impact my clients? That certainly is going to be your primary reaction. But the key issue for you to understand is, given that it is still a law which is in the process of being developed, this is not a critique of the law. This is much more an opportunity for me to share thoughts and for you to respond to the government in terms of the issues which will actually trouble industry. Because all of us so-called experts don't completely understand what the impact of this GST is going to be on these 1.6 crore businesses. We have a sense of the principles, but we don't have a sense of the practicality. And the very big issue in GST is, you will not have a GST unless these 1.6 crore entities actually migrate. And let me just share one thought with you, right? 1.6 crore business entities need to migrate. 
if you see the service base of the people who are helping industry to try and migrate, and that includes the big four and that includes various firms, the estimation is that if you take the service firms in the major cities, in totality they will help 30,000 people to migrate. The collective service base in Bombay, Delhi, Bangalore, Calcutta, Chennai will help at best 30,000 businesses to migrate. What that really means is the large part of this migration is going to happen through people like you. The large part of this migration is going to be you, the people you service, your 100, 200 clients, unless they successfully migrate, you cannot have a GST because what is one common market? One common market means every single person doing a business in this country is part of one common grid and therefore that common grid being GST, we have one common market. It's critical therefore that all of you understand that this is not the domain of experts. This is really the domain of each one of you who goes and deals with the businesses, the medium, the small, the micro. It is that transition which will define the quality of GST. It is not what Lakshmi says or I say or any one of us who come here and make these speeches because we speak pretty much at a 30,000 feet level. If GST has to succeed, it has to succeed for the Banya store, it has to succeed for the micro business. Reliance, Levers, Johnson Johnson alone cannot make the GST. So please understand, it is really a role that all of you have a, to interact with government, and B, in terms of the quality of the service that you can give to your clients. In terms of that GST, the one critical question that you are going to keep getting asked is, how far are we away from GST? Is the 1st of April 2017 real? Is the 1st of April 2017 just another date which is again going to pass? Today, I will speak to you on the place of supply, which is critical in the context of GST because the place of supply actually determines where you want to pay tax and in a GST structure where you pay tax is one of the most essential preconditions to ensure A that tax is rightly paid but more importantly that there is no lingering dispute between one state and another or the center in the state that a tax has not been appropriately paid. It's also important from the context of the time of the supply because both the place and time of supply are the two ingredients which must come together for the levy to fructify and then we will deal in specific with the implications that GST will have on the construction industry. <coughs> How far are we away from the GST? Most of you have seen televised debates which dealt with the first part of the GST which is the passing of the Constitution Amendment Bill. We know that that process is over. We also know that the ratification of the Constitution Amendment Bill is effectively happening at the level of the states and 50% of the states have to ratify it. That is something which is expected to occur no later than about the second to third week of September. So by the second to third week of September, you will have the ratification of the states of the Constitutional Amendment Bill. Please understand, the Constitutional Amendment Bill is merely the empowerment that in the constitutional framework, we can now have a GST. The Constitution Amendment Bill does not address the detailing which has to come through the processes which will now be undertaken. Because it is those processes which will actually determine the details of the GST which we will get. Once we are finished with this process of ratification by the states, it will come back to the President for his assent which will be granted in the normal course. And then we really get into what most people would call the heart of the GST. First, the setting up of the GST Council. As most of you know, there is already an empowered committee of state ministers. It is very likely that this will effectively morph into the GST Council. The GST Council is effectively tasked with series of important issues. But the two most important of those, consensus on the rate structure, what should be the rate for the GST, and please understand that world over, a GST is understood as a unitary tax. What does it mean? It is one tax which attaches either to the event of supply, it attaches to the event of consumption, but it is one tax. In many countries, it is also one rate. 
in our structure, given the factor that we are anticipating inflationary pressures, we will have some exempted, which will be part of the continuation of the exempted goods that we have. We will effectively have a rate between 2 and 6, which might be your gems and jewelry and certain other items. And then we will have the revenue neutral rate and the debate is whether it is from 18 to 22, where is it going to be? But if everything goes into 18 to 22, given that the current services are being taxed at 15, you anticipate inflationary pressures. So to offset that, we are looking at a basket potentially between 10 to 12 percent. And the move is that if the predominant items which make up the consumer price index are put between 10 and 12, we won't have inflation. But the next question is, why we will not have inflation, what will happen to revenue collections? And to offset that, we are talking of a 40% rate for sin goods, so that our ultimate rate structure is likely to be zero, two to six for limited items, 10 to 12 for what predominantly comes under the consumer price index. So to put it simply, 10 to 12 should attach to as many items as are consumed by middle class and lower middle class households. If all of those can come in to the 10 to 12, both in terms of goods and services, then this whole talk of inflation should disappear. But to offset that 10 to 12, we will need to have a 40. And the revenue neutral rate of 18 effectively should take care of almost 90% of those items which effectively don't come into the 10 to 12 basket. So this is the rate structure that the GST Council is uh, going to be responsible for. Most importantly, we need to finalize the law. And in terms of the finalizing of the law, there will be three laws. The IGST law, the CGST law, and the SGST law. The SGST law is the exclusive domain of the states. And the one question that all of you have now seen is that if the states and the center don't agree on this law, then very likely we will have a parliamentary standing committee. And as you have seen in the debate which took place in the Rajya Sabha, there is an insistence that this particular law be not brought as a money bill, but be brought as a finance bill so that we can now have a debate again in the Rajya Sabha. This whole process typically could take another three to four months. And it will take three to four months if actually there is consensus amongst the center and the state. If there is actually dissonance between the center and the state, this could take a little longer. And then there is the issue of integrating with the GST network, what everybody calls the IT backbone. And there is the issue of training. I'm told 60,000 officers of the department have to be trained. And I, if you look at industry, obviously there is the whole cross-section of industry which needs to be trained to get into GST. Bottom line, are we looking at 1st April 2017? It seems like a very tall task. But I don't think that the government will take the foot off the pedal. They will do everything to push industry to 1st April 2017. Very close to that date, maybe a month or so before, there may then at the request of industry be a situation where either they talk of an introduction by 1st July 2017 or the 1st of October 2017. So in all practicality, the pressure will be on every day. If industry is asking the question, should I prepare or not, the answer is very clear. You should have prepared yesterday and effectively you should be preparing today. Without a doubt, you should prepare. But will it be the 1st of April 2017? That's a question. I think practically, you are probably looking at the July or the October. But you need every single day from today if you really are going to make a successful and optimum transition into the GST. Let's talk quickly about the constitutional framework. Under Article 246A, Parliament and state legislatures are empowered to legislate on GST. So this is what brings together the powers. The centre exclusively empowered to legislate on the GST levied on interstate, that is IGST. Power to the states to levy tax on the services for the first time. So as opposed to the earlier constitutional construct where states could not levy any tax on services because it was in the first list, they now have the power. Under Article 269A, Centre will levy GST on the interstate supplies. Centre will also levy tax on the import of goods or services from outside India. 
and the place of supply of goods and services is to be determined as per the rules formulated by the center. The specific entry, the 366.12a, <coughs> talks of a goods and services tax as a tax on the supply of goods and it attaches to all supplies of goods or services except in terms of alcoholic liquor for human consumption. So every commercial transaction of every nature potentially will be part of GST unless it is specifically excluded. Article 286 prohibits states from taxing the interstate supplies. That will remain the exclusive purview of the center. And Article 279A gives us what the functions of the GST Council will be, which in addition to the rate, one of the very important issues they will look for is the mechanism for resolution of disputes between center and states and states in the same. Why is this issue of the dispute between center and state so important? And why is therefore the place of supply so important and why is therefore the time of supply so important? The issue is that when you undertake a transaction, let's say there is a transaction where you appoint a transporter to transport the goods which you have bought in Karnataka to come to Amdava. This is going to pass through at least six to seven states before it comes. One approach in GST globally is that the number of miles that this truck goes through each state divided by what you pay for the transportation is the amount of tax to be paid in each state. This is the approach that some countries have adopted. Now, if this is the basis which you have, that means each state can now tax part of this transportation because it's a service which is being rendered in a way through their state. Then the next question which effectively comes up is, suppose you pay this tax, let us say in six states. Then one of the states says, I actually got less than I should have. So I need to get more. So now what happens? This one state is fighting with five other states on how much tax it should have got. But while they are fighting, the state which says I want to get more tax will of course as reach out to you as the person liable to pay to say pay me the tax. <coughs> At the same time, the other five states are not going to give you a refund of that tax automatically. All these six states, therefore, potentially, could be in a dispute with each other. But in this dispute, unlike in the tax disputes you know today, where you can fight with the department, this is a fight between six states. The states will fight for what is the appropriate tax. You potentially are the bystander, although you are the most affected party. And in this sort of a scenario, the states will effectively fight. Today there is no mechanism to resolve this. And while the states fight, essentially you will be out of pocket with the tax, possibly suffering some sort of a tax claim from one or more states saying I deserve to get more. So while I have sort of tried to illustrate it in its most gory form, this is the sort of dispute that we are likely to see. And it is with a view to actually obviate this nature of dispute that the place of supply becomes so important and the time of supply becomes so important because if they can, with some degree of specification, fix the time and place for the levy, then states will not fight, then you will have a certain tax regime and obviously the whole purpose of GST is for us to move to a simple regime where the extent of litigation is lesser and lesser and the certainty of tax paid is higher and higher. So from that perspective, all of these constitutional provisions will interplay, but the key provision is going to be, how do we fix rate, how do we fix value, how do we fix the place of supply, and how do we create a mechanism that if an issue comes up as to how much state A should have recovered versus state B, that dispute is resolved in as quickly and as efficiently a period of time and manner that we can ensure. Some key facets in terms of the GST, as you know, it will be a dual model. You will have C and S GST on interstate. You will have I on interstate. Center and states will concurrently legislate, administer and levy. Now, this is important. When center and states will concurrently legislate, the question which comes up is, most of you who remember the introduction of the VAT, on the day of introduction of VAT, 
we got a historic affirmation of the principle of cooperative federalism. Everybody agreed to the same law. But if we now see this 12 years ends, every state has made some deviation. And the sum total of those deviations is that we now are almost dealing with a separate law in each state. Now, there is a potential for that to happen in GST. Given in our federation the structure that the states have sovereign rights, there is a possibility that a state may legislate differently from the center and may legislate differently from B state. The fact that a state has that right will mean that at least on day one we have to ensure that everybody has the same law, center and states, each state. But there is a potential that over time states will say, I want some variation. And the variation may well be on law, it may also be on rate, it may also be on exemption, it may also be on valuation principles. So it is not that we get a GST which is uniform on day one. It is very important that having got the GST, we nurture it in a way that it remains uniform and consistent all over the country over a period of time. Now, one of the key factors why people talk of a GST is that the rate of GST, whether it is 18 or whatever it is, ultimately is lower than the average tax rate where indirect taxes in any transaction are between 24 to 32%. Compared to the 24 to 32%, getting the 18 is a huge advantage. The second advantage is, today all sorts of taxes which you pay, if you pay a VAT, but ultimately your service pays a service tax, you know that you've lost the credit. The one fundamental principle of a GST globally is, all indirect taxes paid at an antecedent point in a transaction become complete credit at a subsequent point in a transaction. That's one of the fundamental pillars. So you will get complete credit in the context of taxes made. Now, as far as we are concerned, the levy will cover supplies for consideration. Lakshmi mentioned certain transactions where there is still a doubt what happens in terms of certain types of branch transfers, etc. So all transactions will be taxed, save and accept what is exempted, what is outside the purview of GST like Alcobep, and transactions which are below the prescribed limit of 10 lakhs. Other than that, everything is effectively going to be taxed in the context of the GST. So what will effectively happen? If it is intrastate, you will pay C and S. If it is interstate, you will pay only I. The import of goods and services will pay I, and exports will continue to be zero rated. As far as the credit is concerned, if you have a credit of C GST, you can utilize it to pay C and I GST. If you have a credit of SGST, you can utilize to pay SGST and IGST. If you have IGST, it is fully fungible. You can use it to pay I, C, or S. So this one slide effectively tells you A, which tax will apply, and given the credits which you have available, how you will be able to utilize those credits. If we look at the proposed structure in a nutshell, to the lower end of the slide is a outside India foreign supplier or customer. To the top of the slide, you have a supplier who is in state A. If he supplies to a customer also in state A, which means intra, then you will pay C and S GST. If he supplies across the states, it is interstate, he supplies to state B, then you will pay an I GST. On the import of goods, you will pay BCD and IGST. On the export of goods, you will effectively be zero rated. This is the basic structure that we need to keep in mind. <coughs> in terms of the charging provision for intrastate, C and S will be leviable. It is collected on all intrastate supplies. The payment will be by a taxable person who is defined. The taxable payable on reverse charge is only for noted, notified supplies and businesses whose aggregate turnover is lesser than 50 lakhs can opt for a composition scheme. The full mechanics of the composition scheme are not out, but very likely it will be a fixed percentage to be paid in 12 installments. So it's a far simpler basis 
of uh, adoption in terms of the administration and compliance. On interstate, IGST is leviable. Supply of goods or services in the course of interstate trade and commerce will fall in this basket. Imports will fall in this basket. And export transactions will also be treated as interstate, although all export transactions essentially will be zero rate. If I see the current provisions versus the GST model law, at one level, we look at the levy, look at the taxable event, and look at do you need to have consideration or not to suffer a tax. In excise, the event is manufacture. Consideration not necessary because you can even adopt under the valuation rules. Sans consideration, you can still be liable and they will take some notional or proxy value. Service tax, the taxable event is the rendition of service. Yes. If you have a monetized transaction, that will be the basis of value or they will adopt a non-monetary basis through an alternate set through the valuation rules. Value added tax, event is sale. The sale price is the basis of the taxation. Absent a sale price, I will not suffer levy. GST, taxable event is supply and your consideration. If it exists, it becomes the basis of your valuation. If it doesn't exist, the valuation rules effectively allow you to take proxy values and those proxy values effectively will flow consistent with the principles that we already adopt for the custom valuation rules which are being adopted for the purposes of excise. What is the grid of those rules? First, transaction value. The price paid or payable effectively becomes the basis. This is the predominant basis. If this is not acceptable, then they look for identical goods, because in customs, please understand, the levies to our goods. They will look for identical goods. That means, like in all circumstances, what we internationally call capable of being replaced both commercially and technically. They will look for those. If not, you go to similar. Similar means that they do not correspond exactly like identical. They are variations, but the variations can be adjusted for. After that, you come to an alternate basis. Either you use computed value, that means you take the cost of production and keep adding elements, including a profit element as normal in the industry, or you take a deductive value, which means you take the retail sale price or the sale price to a non-related party, deduct all local taxes and expenses, and effectively come to the valuation. So this is the basis on which we will go. It is a basis till now untested in VAT. It is a basis till now untested in the context of either excise or service tax. So one big change that we are making is that we are taking the basis of valuation for imported goods and effectively applying that to all of the supplies which will occur, both of goods and services, under the GST. Place of supply. There is a widespread consensus that in the context of a VAT or a GST, the levy should be on a destination principle. This is a major deviation from where we are today because in our situation, the VAT is an origin-based tax unless we effectively make a branch transfer and the event of taxation then occurs in the destination state. But we essentially proceed on the basis of an origin tax, now we move entirely to the destination principle. Why do I need to actually determine the place of supply? As I mentioned, essentially, I first need to categorize. Am I liable to a IGST, which means interstate, for which I must fix the place of supply as being in another state? Or am I liable to the CNS, in which case I must fix the place of supply as being interstate? So the first fundamental of the levy is where is the transaction occurring, because that is where I pay tax. The second situation that I need to look at is, depending upon whether I pay I or whether I pay CNS, this will also have an impact in the context of my compliance. This will also have a huge impact 
in terms of what credit pool do I have in the relevant place and therefore how much of the credit pool can I offset for the purposes of the tax payment. And if we see most com commentaries on the GST, it will tell you that there are three primary principles why we ensure a clear place of supply. One, we want to avoid double taxation. Right now, if we license know-how, the licensing of know-how can in customs suffer a custom valuation charge, in excise it can suffer a charge again in terms of intangibles, under service tax it can suffer a charge, and under VAT in terms of transference of right to use, it can suffer. Now it is one transaction for the license of technology, but it suffers four taxes of a completely different character. One on the event of importation, two on the event of manufacture, three on the event of rendition of service, and four on the event of sale. And this is where Supreme Court has gone into saying that if you can have four points of taxation, all four taxes of a different character, all four taxes under different entry of the constitution, then obviously the system we have today doesn't work, and which is why we are looking to move to the GST. So A, I want to avoid double taxation. I also want to avoid double non-taxation and I want to ensure that there is no distortion. So typically as we've seen throughout the years, if one state has a lower tax than the other, then the entirety of the trade for that particular item moves to the state of lower taxation. That is what we call essentially an economic dissonance. That economic dissonance or artificial movement of goods <coughs> based on taxes is what we will effectively eliminate. So in terms of the place of supply, Ultimately, we will be driven by one principle, which is the destination principle. The OECD has effectively come through with a series of guidelines, which are suggestive guidelines that several nations should follow, including us. But if we see, the guideline in terms of place of supply for goods is relatively straightforward because goods are tangible, we know where they start, we know where they end. But you will again follow a destination <coughs> principle. Goods are generally taxed where they are delivered. In terms of the B2B, in services and intangibles, the OECD tells us that services of intangibles should be taxed on the <coughs> jurisdictional principle of consumption, which means destination. For B2B supplies, the jurisdiction in which the customer is located will have the taxing rights. The identity of the customer is normally determined by reference to his business arrangements, nature of his contracts, etc. And when a customer has establishments in more than one jurisdiction, the taxing right accrued to the jurisdiction where the establishment using the service is located. Taxing rights may be allocated by reference to a proxy. So for example, supplier's location or any other place of performance. So a proxy is of course an alternate to the destination principle and for supplies directly connected with immovable property, the taxing rights will be allocated to the jurisdiction where the immovable property is located. This OECD principle is what has actually dictated the basis for most of the place of supply rules in all of the countries who have effectively adopted the GST. Now, in terms of the B2C again, two additional set of rules. For supplies that are physically performed at a readily identifiable location and are ordinarily consumed at the same time and place, the jurisdiction to tax is the jurisdiction in which the supply is physically performed. For other supplies, the guidelines recommend that the place of taxation should be based on the customer's usual residence. Now, our draft model GST law is very closely aligned with these above principles. Why is that important? A, because it gives us predictability uh, in terms of being able to borrow and look at global precedents in terms of language, legislation, and judicial precedent. B, to the extent that we want to try and invite more and more foreign direct investment, the fact that our principles are the same as those followed the world over is obviously another factor of some comfort. What is the position under the existing law? All of you are familiar with the place of provision of supply rules. Rules 3 down to Rule 11, we have in various places our default rule, which is Rule 3, says that service shall be deemed to be provided where the service receiver is located. And then we have a series of specific situations, either by service or by the nature of the transaction. 
And one important situation we have is under Rule 9, where we have intermediary services, both in the context of goods and now also in the context of services. The current set of rules that we have essentially have raised some of their own issues. And let's take three of the principal issues which have come up. Transactions between overseas office and branches. We have a provision whereby even if you have an office or a branch of the same business entity, by a deeming fiction of law, we consider these as two separate entities and any flow of supply between the two of these is effectively taxable. <laughs> so from our perspective, we have a special provision of the law which is unprecedented anywhere else and that is creating its own set of litigation because if I supply to self and there is no consideration, the very basis for the levy of service tax should not exist, but today, through the deeming provision, it exists. The second situation is intermediaries who effectively help as commission agents for goods belonging to foreign customers and help them sell them here. When this issue was tested, CBEC, in two separate circulars, 2009 and 2011, clarified that this is an export of services. We also had judgments in the case of Blue Star and Paul Merchants, which effectively said that this is an export of services. However, we tweaked the definition of intermediary in such a way that this, which should have been an export of service, is now effectively still taxable. The same sort of situation exists not only for intermediary services for goods, but also intermediary services for service transactions. As a result, what should be an export is currently being taxed. And as we sort of move forward, all these points which are currently contentious, namely branch office, namely overseas office, intermediary services, these will actually disappear because as we move into the GST, these are no longer issues which are going to vex us. What is the situation in terms of place of supply under the GST? Article 269A, which is proposed to be inserted by the 122nd CFB, talks of the factor that the principles for determining the place of supply and when a supply of goods or services of both takes place will be formulated by the parliament. So essentially, this is something which is specifically reserved for the centre. Chapter 4 of your draft model law and specifically sections 5 and 6 provide for the principles on determination of place of supply for the goods and services. Now, what is it that they provide? The first and most important change is that the place of supply shifts from origin to destination. So where supply involves the movement of goods, the place of supply under section 5 will be the location at which the movement of goods terminates for delivery. So therefore, if in a normal transaction you buy goods, but your purchase of goods causes the uh, goods to move from, let us say, Bangalore to Ahmedabad, what you will have is termination of delivery occurring in Ahmedabad. Gujarat will now be the state where the place of supply occurs, and as a result, Gujarat will have the right to tax. Where goods are delivered before or during the movement, either by way of transfer of documents of title or otherwise, to a recipient, then in such a situation, the place of supply will be the principal place of business of the third person. So many of us are familiar with this in terms of IC sale. Entity A in India, let us say in the state of Gujarat, orders goods from Singapore. While the goods are effectively in transit, by a exchange of documents of title, those goods are sold to somebody in Madhya Pradesh. The question is, what is the destination? Where should this be taxed? The simple principle is, whoever was the original author of the transaction, namely in this case the person in Gujarat, he will fix the place of supply and therefore in this situation, if originally the goods were ordered by somebody in Gujarat, but later on there was a transference to exchange of documents, then it is Gujarat who will have the right to tax. Where supply does not involve the movement of goods, the location of goods at the time of delivery. So if it is delivered at factory gate, that will be the location. If it is delivered at another point, that will be the location. But wherever the location of the goods at time of delivery, 
that will effectively fix the place of supply where there is no movement. In terms of installation and assembly, the place of installation and assembly. Where goods are supplied on board a conveyance or a vessel, then the location at which the goods are taken on board. So therefore, situation, you buy food in a plane. You are essentially 30,000 feet above the ground. What is the place of supply? Now, if the food was loaded onto the plane in Mumbai, Maharashtra will tax. If the food was loaded onto the plane in Delhi, then effectively Delhi will tax. In cases which are not covered by these, the parliament will evolve. And this is where I am saying that while the law is in a manner evolved, there will be practical examples which are still not addressed. And that is really where I think the interaction from uh, the community of CAs or business is really required to help highlight what this should be. Coming to place of supply of services, this is dealt with by section 6. The default principle, almost like rule 3 today in terms of our place of supply, is that if you services are provided to a registered person, which will normally be another business, then the location of the service recipient. But if services are provided to an unregistered person, that means at a more retail level, in that situation, whatever is the address available with the service provider of where the service recipient is based or else the location of the service provider. So let me take this. Suppose you have a courier company which is going to courier goods to a company which is well known and which is registered. Then wherever it is registered, that actually fixes the place. But suppose it is couriering goods to an individual now that individual, if they know his address, in a courier company they will, then the situation it is that place. But if they don't know the address, then it goes back to being the place of the supplier of the service. <coughs> now for certain specified services, of course we have greater articulation. So if services are in relation to immovable property, then the service recipient is registered or unregistered. Location of the immovable property is the place of supply. If you talk of accommodation in a hotel, location again of the immovable property. Restaurants, catering, location where the service are actually performed. So these are all location based. Service is in relation to training, performance appraisal. If the entity is registered, look to the location of the service recipient. <laughs> Admission to events and amusement parks, again location of the amusement park. Organization of events and services ancillary to these events, location of service recipient. If however unregistered, then location of the service provider or where the service is performed. Transportation of goods including mail or courier, registered location of service recipient, unregistered where the location where the goods will be handed over for the purposes of transportation. And insurance services, if registered location of service recipient, if unregistered, location of the service recipient on record of this service provider. If you have passenger transport, again, if registered location of service recipient, if unregistered, then the place where the passenger embarks on the conveyance. So the point of emanation of the, of the entire transfer or of the travel. Services on board a conveyance such as a vessel, aircraft, etc. Location of the first scheduled point of departure of the conveyance. Important one for everyone, telecommunication services. Here they have three distinct categories. For fixed line communication, the location or installation of the fixed line. For post paid services, the billing address of the service receiver for prepaid services where the voucher is sold. Now this has become one of the talking points because the service is the same. But if it is postpaid, you go by the billing address of the service receiver. If it is prepaid, then you effectively will tax where the voucher is sold. And therefore this is certainly a dichotomy in terms of the approach. Banking and other financial services, including stock broking, Location of the service receiver on the records of the service provider, where service is not linked into the account, that means it is subsidiary services, location of the supplier of services, namely now the bank. 
And if it is advertisement services meant for an identifiable state, which you give to the center or the state, then if there is an identifiable state, the taxation will occur there. So as you can see, the basic principle is destination. The basic principle where a party is registered is effectively that registered address. In all other situations, they try and make some sort of deviation. Two key definitions, location of recipient of service and location of supplier of service. And within this, uh, important to look at subclause 2, that where a supply is received at a place other than the place of business for which registration has been obtained, that is to be a fixed establishment elsewhere, the location of such fixed establishment. So, if you are a large corporation, but being a large corporation, you have your registration in one place, now you will need a registration in every state. But let us say you take security and cleaning services. Let us say you take local audit services. Let us say you take local legal services. If you take them in a different state and in and through a different office, then irrespective of where your registration of your head office is, you will have to pay tax. And the taxable event will be in the state in which you actually consume and the destination of the consumption of the service will be important. Also look at three, where a supply is received at more than one establishment. So let us say audit services were provided to all offices of a company. Then one issue is whether the place of business or which establishment, the location of the establishment most directly concerned with the supply of service is where you pay. Now this is undefined. Because what do you mean by the location of establishment most directly concerned? Is it where the highest profit is? Is it where the auditors spend the most time? This is not a basis which is still clear. Which doesn't mean that it's a critique. All that needs to happen is that this needs to have more clarity. The same concepts which you have of location of recipient of service, the mirror image of those are location of supplier of service. So essentially, this tells you A, where the supply of service happens, but it also by definition tells you where is the recipient of service located and where is the, uh, where is the location of the supplier of service. So you fix three things, who provides, who receives, where is it provided and therefore where is it taxable. Let's look at one of these in the context of an example. If we look at the place of supply provisions as set out now in the draft law, let us say you have an agreement for market research entered into between company Y, which is to the right of your slide in state B, and company X, which is to the left of your slide at state A. Then what happens is company Y, which is a market research company, provides a service to the head office of company X. That head office in turn makes available the report of market research to its various branch offices, which could be, for example, in state C, D, E, F, G. So now what is the place of supply? State A, where the company X head office directly receives the service from company Y, will take part of it, and state C, where the services are transmitted to the branch office for ultimate use. And now between these will come the question of saying which has the most direct or proximate connection. And it is these sort of issues which will fall within that basket to say which has the greatest proximate connection and therefore that will help us fix the place of supply. Now, some of the issues which will come up is where you have services across different states, you need to assign a consideration on a statewide basis for each of those states. And this is going to be contentious. Because the consideration that you assign by state is also going to determine the tax that each state collects. And therefore, there is a potential for dispute between the states over the taxing jurisdiction. You will also, in these sort of situations where services are taken in more than one place, require a pan-India service provider to register, to pay your SGST and for all your compliances. You also see that we don't have in the present law, a set of rules for intermediary services like we used to have in terms of our place of supply rules that we currently have. 
and in several sectors you will find some specific issues. So for example, there is an inconsistency in the place of supply for prepaid customers and postpaid. As we said, in terms of prepaid, it is place of sale of voucher, in postpaid it's a billing address. Now why this factor of divergence is unexplained, but obviously it is one of the issues which at least as far as the telecom company and its officers are concerned will be an issue. Uh, in terms of international freight, suppose my goods are effectively coming from UK. They go from UK to Dubai. From Dubai they now go into another vessel and Dubai to India is a different leg. Today we will seek to tax all of this in a reverse charge. The initial leg, which is outside India to outside India, is effectively not going to be zero rated, is not going to be excluded. <coughs> Let's look at place of supply international precedence, right? In, let me just take a minute because some of us do have a chance sometimes to go into these meetings where people are deciding the principles which should be there or there is some debate between industry and the government. And you know, most of the time, what people will say, most chambers of commerce will say, oh, look at the international precedent. And as sometimes happens, some of our bureaucrats or some of our ministers are allergic to that and they say, no, why should we look at it? We are India, we know how to formulate this ourselves. And you know, when you see this interaction, I am reminded of a <coughs> little story that I must share. So, where you have Red Indians in USA, they are seen as people who have a lot of native wisdom. So, Red Indian tribes effectively are able to predict what sort of a winter you are going to have? Okay, is it going to be severe or not? And one of the signs of how severe the winter will be is the number of smoke signals that the Red Indians release. So what happened is in one of these tribes, the tribal chief who had a lot of experience died. His son effectively took over. And first day of the winter coming in, his tribe came and said, Oh chief, how much smoke? And he didn't know what this was. So he just said, expect a moderate winter, so modest smoke. So they started putting the smoke. Next day, again came and said, oh chief, how much smoke? Now this guy didn't know, so he said, let me call the weather office and be sure. So he called the weather office and said, how severe will be the winter? And they said, very. So he said, more smoke. Next day again they come back, say, how much smoke? He calls the weather office. They say, very severe. So he says, more smoke. Third day, again they come. He again calls. They say, very, very severe. Then more smoke. On the third day, he says to the weather office, how do you know it's going to be a very, very severe winter? He says, the Indians are releasing a lot of smoke. <laughs> so the issue today, we are seeking guidance from those people who essentially admit that they have got their law wrong. And the most important part of the law which they have got wrong is place of supply. So today, as we venture into GST, either we learn from their mistakes, or we actually have the opportunity to create the best place of supply rules that the others in the world should follow. But on this one issue, the international precedent, admittedly by everyone internationally, is not perfect, and in fact has not achieved the results that they want. Having said which, let's look at what they do. If you talk of a supply of goods under the European Union, place where the transport of the goods to the person acquiring them ends. So it is the place of delivery which we have adopted. Or location of the goods at the time of supply where goods are not dispatched or transported. Both these principles we have adopted. If you see Singapore and Malaysia, it is the place of location of goods. If you see Canada, it is the province of the recipient of the goods. Likewise, supply of services B2B, place where the customer has established his business is the basis in the European Union, location of the fixed establishment to which the services are provided or place where the customer usually resides. If we see Singapore, Malaysia on B2B, all services provided by service providers in the country or received by a service recipient from abroad are treated as provided in the country. Please understand, in Singapore, Malaysia, they don't have the issue of state, etc. They are either talking about the factor that it is in the country or it is not in the country. And that is only logical because 
uh, I think Singapore on its best day may actually be smaller than either Calcutta or Bombay. So, supply of services again, B2C, you see the global basis, place where the supplier has established his business, or the location of the fixed establishment for which services are provided, or place where the supplier usually resides. Now, Europe in a way is seen as the intellectual leader on GST. And if you see, the only variations are Singapore and Malaysia, where because Europe has issues like us, many countries equivalent to our states, and you have to decide where the tax should be between these. But the moment you look at Singapore or Malaysia, because they are more unitary from a geographical and political perspective, effectively as long as the goods or the services are rendered in the country, they will effectively tax. Now some of the exceptions to the general rule that they follow, if you have services connected with immovable property, then location of property, passenger transport, pro rata according to distance covered, that means each state can tax, which is a nightmare. B2C transport of goods, the place of departure, activities relating to culture, art, etc., location of event, and restaurant and catering, the place of service provided. So effectively you will see that the predominance of what is covered, 95% of the tax generating transactions are under a destination principle. It is only 5% of the tax generating transactions which are in some exception. And often people say that it may not be worthwhile investing the time and energy for those exceptional transactions because they contribute very, very little to the overall pool of the tax that we will collect. Moving from the place of supply to the time of supply, because as you know, the time and place of taxation must come together for the event of taxation to occur. So in terms of the time of supply, the taxable event for GST supply, if it is interstate supply, <coughs> as we know we will pay G and C, inter interstate will pay the I, and the meaning and scope of supply is of course provided under section 3. The liability to pay GST will arise at the time of supply of goods or services. This is articulated now in section 12 and 13. So the time of supply of goods is in section 12 and the time of supply of services is in section 13. What is the significance of time of supply? A. It determines the time at which you will pay, which fused with the place of payment actually determines the time and place, therefore the place of the levy. Also, it helps you to establish other issues, namely in terms of your registration, calculation of your turnover, your right to exemptions. All these are dependent on both of these concepts of place and time coming together. Now, if we see time of supply under section 12 for goods and then for services, the earliest of the following dates for goods, removal of the goods, for supply to the recipient, making available the goods to the recipient, issuance of invoice, receipt of payment, or showing the receipt of goods in the books of account. Any one of these, the earliest of these, <coughs> determines the time of supply. Correspondingly in services, when you issue the invoice, or if you receive payment, therefore advances of course also trigger a tax. Completion of the service, or the recipient shows receipt of service in their books of accounts. So this becomes the principle in terms of time. <coughs> time of supply where liability is on a reverse charge, the earliest of the following days. Either the receipt of goods or receipt of invoice or when payment is made or when the debt is recognized in the books. On reverse charge for services, receipt of service, receipt of invoice, making of payment or debit in the books. Now this is a basis that we have taken quite consistently with what we see in Europe. The only variation we have is issue uh, E in terms of the fact that on that we have something of a dissonance but the rest of it we are actually following what is a global standard. Now time of supply in case of continuous supply. So you have long-term engineering contracts, you have long-term supply contracts, what happens? For goods, expiry of the period for which 
successive statement of accounts of payments are made. Where no such statement of accounts are involved, the date of issuance of invoice or receipt of payment. So if you have successive statements of supply, let's say quarterly, monthly, whatever, the issuance of the statement itself is what will trigger the tax. But if you are not issuing such statements or accounts, then the issuance of your invoice or the date of receipt of payment. Because service is in a continuous supply situation, whatever be the due date of payment will be the time of supply. Where the due date is not ascertainable, then whenever you receive the payment or issue an invoice, and where the payment is linked to completion of the event, the time of completion of the event. But in all these cases, please remember, the earliest of the alternate events is what effectively triggers the time of supply. So therefore, at the very earliest of all these alternatives, the time of supply will occur. Time of supply in specific scenarios, where it is not possible to determine when the supply will take place. When it becomes known that the supply has taken place or six months from the removal. In case of services, where the supply of a service ceases under a contract, even if it is before the completion of the supply, that is the time of supply. So, as far as we are concerned, if you are not covered by any of these specific rules, then the date on which your return is filed, and in any other case, the date on which the tax payment is actually made. So, moving on from here to the GST implications on the construction industry. Let's first take a walk through what have been the significant developments legally in terms of the taxation in the construction industry. First, this is Gannon Dunkerley 1. At that stage, they said that the levy could not be brought because Supreme Court said that a composite works contract cannot be bifurcated and sales tax cannot be levied on the sales portion. This necessitated, as all of us know, a constitutional amendment in terms of section 36629A in 1983 where we now facilitated the bifurcation so that we could levy sales tax on the sale element in a composite contract. Thereafter, from a services perspective, we had the introduction of a levy of a service tax on works contract from 1-6-2007. Immovable property forming part of composite contracts was held not to be liable to VAT in the LNT contract and in the LNT judgment. And LNT also said that prior to 1-6-2007, you could not have a service tax on the service element in a works contract. Then we had the Suresh Kumar Bansal judgment, which has made a huge impact because there it is said that if you wanted to levy service tax on the service element, you first needed a basis to fix what is the value of the immovable property. Because once you took that away, then alone could you predict what was the service element. And although there are abatement notifications, because there was no provision to provide for the value of the land and for it to be taken away, it is said that the levy was not sustainable. We also had the judgment in terms of Sumer Corporation, where it was said that the TDRs, which are very prevalent in Maharashtra, the transferable development rights, that that itself constitutes a sale liable to VAT. And now, with all of this background, in terms of whether goods can be taxed, services can be taxed, whether rights in immovable property can be taxed, in all of this background, we effectively now move into the GST. Four elements for us to look at. What is the taxable event? What is the value? What is the credit? And what is the compliance? In terms of the definition of supply under Section 3, as you know, all forms of supply of goods or services will effectively be liable. Supplies which are specified in Schedule 1 are in a way additionally brought into the reach of the definition of supply. Relevant to the real estate sector, Schedule 2 provides that Schedule 2 shall apply for determining what is or what is to be treated as a supply of goods or a supply of services. And the activity of construction is effectively made liable prior to the stage of the completion certificate or the OC, either in terms of serial number 5B or serial number 5F of the second schedule. So if we see the language of 5B and 5F, 
what it says is that the construction of a complex, whether a building, civil structure or part thereof, including a complex or a building intended for sale to a buyer wholly or partly, except in a situation where the entire consideration has been received after issuance of the completion certificate. So therefore, all situations where any part of the consideration flows prior to the completion certificate will be liable. And the definition of works contract includes the transfer of property in goods which are involved in the execution of a works contract. That is what 5F provides. And section 207, 2 into bracket 107, provides what is the definition of a works contract which is defined to mean an agreement for carrying out either for cash, deferred payment or other valuable consideration, building, construction, etc. But it also goes on to include repair, renovation or any other form of modification or improvement. So effectively you are seeing the footprint of taxation is much wider for the real estate sector. Now 5B is similar really to the position that we had under 66E of the Finance Act. Here a challenge was made before the Mumbai High Court and the Mumbai High Court repelled it to say that no, there is no dual taxation. Merely because Maharashtra charges a stamp duty when the ultimate conveyance is made, it does not mean that the services prior to the OC are not separately liable and chargeable to a service tax. So that position will remain. There is no scope now for a constitutional amendment, more so because the 122nd constitutional amendment also effectively lays down the groundwork. So the issue now is going to be, yes, there is taxation if you pay anything prior to the point of time of the completion certificate. And the works contract is treated, unlike in the past where we used to see it as a co-joint contract for the supply of goods and the supply of services, now, by a provision of law, works contract is treated as a supply of service. So therefore, all works contract will be treated as a supply of service. Clearly, this is divergent from the current practice where we treat it as a composite contract for supply of goods and services. There is no condition anymore of the transfer of property in goods. Uh, if we contrast with what we have today, it does not include any other similar activity of service a similar activity by way of maintenance. The concept which we have today of original work also effectively goes and as I said the entry is made much wider because now fabrication, building etc. are also brought within the service. So one part of the situation is construction industry will effectively A, have a larger wider taxing entry. Two, the situation is that all works contract will now be treated as a service and not as a partly a supply of goods and partly a supply of services. What will change? One, all the red boxes that you are seeing are the taxes that you paid today which don't give you a credit. All the green boxes that you are seeing uh, on the left hand side are where you pay tax but get credit today. Then when you see the right hand side, these are all the taxes you will pay but which will give you credit. So the bottom line is, today in the construction sector, of the indirect taxes you paid, you got a very limited amount of credit for tax paid. Into the future, one of the advantages that you will get a more robust amount of tax credit in the real estate sector than you are getting at this point in time. Coming to the valuation, the entire transaction will be treated as a supply of service. There is no specific provision on valuation for transactions relating to construction industry. Therefore, the normal law applies. There is no availability currently of the alternate schemes like abatement, composition, etc. As we know, other in terms of the abatement, composition, etc., in VAT you end up probably paying only 0.6% in Gujarat uh, in the context of uh, the service tax you end up paying 4.5%. So these abatements have ensured that the amount of taxation is at a lower level. But we don't see that in the GST right now. Uh, we also do not see an enabling provision for the exclusion of the value of immovable property, which is what the Delhi High Court had asked for. At present the valuation will be done as per section 15, 
with the GST rules. Therefore, transaction value, that is what you actually pay. And within this, you will include also uh, free of cost supplies, all taxes and duties which are levied other than the SC or IGST. So, besides the fact that the footprint of taxation is wider, the concept of valuation which will suffer the tax is also effectively wider. Now, in some cases, if you are exchanging non-monetary consideration or parties are related or it is believed that the declared price is not accurate, then they will go to the valuation rules. And once they go to the valuation rules, they will look at similar, identical, and apply those concepts. Now, let me give you a practical example. Suppose I book a flat in a project in 19, uh, sorry, in 2015. This is pre-OC. I pay X. Somebody now books one year later. They also book pre-OC, but they pay, let's say, more than I have paid. Now, both are identical flats. The flat, let us say I have it on the third floor, somebody else has it on the fourth floor. Now, there are two elements of risk. The fact that somebody later paid higher may actually bring into question my valuation. And if they then say that the identical flat to yours, six months, eight months, twelve months later went for much higher, then as far as I am concerned, no matter what I pay, effectively, that will always be vulnerable in terms of somebody saying that I am going to look at similar or identical goods. Because in this particular industry, while location may be identical, unit size may be identical, we know that prices keep varying. So this is again going to be a risk in terms of fixing the valuation. Again, in terms of the rate of taxation, today we know under the current regime, you are treated as a composite contract. Your effective VAT rate is only 0 0.6. Service tax is 4.5. The service tax and VAT are levied on a weighted value. And you have various sort of composition schemes. <clears throat> One big change could be that if the real estate sector and this service goes into the revenue neutral rate, then from what you are currently seeing at 0.6 and 4.5, you could straight away leapfrog into 18%. Currently, no abatements are prescribed. Currently, there are no composition schemes. So I'm sure the industry is working with government to bring back composition, to bring back abatement. But currently, this is one of the highest risk sectors because a tax rate which is in the region of 5.1 could effectively go straight away to 18. And that is effectively the risk that this industry runs. Here again, in terms of time and place of supply, uh, same principles which we discussed earlier. Place of supply, uh, where the service is to a registered person, the location of the recipient, and time of supply, the earliest of the various alternate dates that we are looking at. The one big gain is in the context of input tax credit. Uh, certainly, the availability of credit will be far greater. Uh, you will get inputs, input services and capital goods. All of the taxes you pay will become credit. However, there is a significant onus from a compliance perspective because you have to reconcile between the supplier and uh, the tax paid. But one very important change is that there is no restriction on capital goods. The 50-50% basis that you have for capital goods disappears. In the very first year itself, the entirety of the credit on the capital goods can be taken. So from that perspective, there is a far greater facilitation. One problem, of course, is that under Section 169, what they say is, sub-clause C says, goods or services acquired by the principal in the execution of a works contract, when such contract results in the construction of immovable property, then you cannot get credit. So even from a credit perspective, while in the first flush it seems that there is greater facilitation, the factor that there is a restrictive clause, that any works contract which ultimately results in the creation of an immovable property, is something where you will not get the credit, again creates a huge disincentive for this industry. So they have A, a greater taxable footprint, B, a higher value, 
C, a greater rate, and D, a far restricted basis for the purposes of the availment of credit. So, in terms of tax credit, pros are you no need to use input at the place of business, you get entire fungibility, and in terms of capital goods, you get 100% upfront. But the cons, and I must say that the cons are far greater, the restriction for the credit for immovable property is going to be extremely detrimental. So as I said, overall, these industry is going to suffer on four counts. Plus, uh, if we see, as far as they are concerned, tax cost therefore will go up incrementally, both in terms of valuation and in terms of rate. The effective tax cost also goes up because the credit available is lesser. And from their perspective, therefore, this industry is likely to be one of the worst affected in the context of the GST. There is also the issue of compliance, because from the perspective of this industry, obviously the amounts are so large that they are going to have to be registered. Uh, they are part of the tax net. They need registrations across the board. And just to give an example, if you have a national level company, whether it's Tata Housing, whether it is Godred, etc. And for all businesses which are at a national level, if you see the compliance which you will have in GST, as compared to the compliance you have today, where you might have essentially one filing, <coughs> per state your filings will go up to 37. And that multiplied by 30 effectively means that almost 1,100, uh, no, well, 1,110 filings will have to be done in a year. So one of the situations which is going to be really complex for the purposes of all businesses is that the level of compliance effectively goes up. It is to be undertaken almost across the board on 30 states given the size of your business. And given that a lot of disputes today are disputes in terms of compliance, it does worry me personally that even if we get a perfect law, if we don't get either perfect procedure or perfect administration, we could still be in an era of very, very high litigation. Let me end here. Uh, a lot of people ask me, what is the secret for us to move to GST successfully? And I always stress two things. One is knowledge, and the second is preparedness. And as I close here, let me illustrate that with a story. There were four people in a village in England who every day would go from the village by a train into London. One person was a very senior person, he was a tax administrator. And he used to give help to his other poor passenger, who was one of his assessees. Because every day he would dominate the assessee, abuse the assessee, uh, which is not like, of course, many of our officers we have here, but in this story that was the case. Two other people who were traveling in the train, one was a kind old lady and one was a very pretty young lady. Every day that this train used to travel, it used to pass through a tunnel. And in the tunnel, for 20 seconds, there would be darkness, and then the train would emerge and then go on to London. One day when this train was going and went into the tunnel, two sounds were heard, a kiss and a slap, and then the train comes out of the tunnel. And in that train, all four people are sitting, wondering what happens. The old lady says, my God, one of these guys kissed this pretty girl. She slapped them. Very good. I'm very happy. The young pretty girl says, here I am, young and pretty. They don't kiss me. They kiss this poor old lady. I'm glad they got slapped. The guy who is the tax collector, he has actually been slapped. His cheek is red. He's very angry. He says, this idiot kisses one of the women. I get slapped. <laughs> and this person who has been beaten up every day, he says, what a wonderful world. I kiss my own hand. I slap the old guy, I can get away with anything. <laughs> the key factor is, this guy had both the knowledge and the preparedness. He had the knowledge of the tunnel and he had the preparedness of how to deal with the tunnel. This is GST. There is a dark tunnel. But if you have the knowledge and preparedness, you will get it. Thank you very much. It's been a real pleasure. Just a few moments, please. The audience. Look at Rohan Shah. You started with a lot of humbleness, mentioning about you being one of the son-in-law of Dandabad. 
thank you for that mentioning it. We will take care in the future to make it part of your resume too. Sir, you have taken us through the topic in a very lucid and a detailed manner. You have rightly highlighted how we chartered accountants can be perhaps the most important stakeholder and rather instrumental in the transition and the implementation of the GST. You also explained how cooperative federalism is so important in order to avoid the fight between the states to tax and in this context how the time and place of supply is so important. You also took us through the impact on the construction industry and the issues on valuation and last but not the least you also gave us the practical tips on the knowledge and the preparedness and a very uh, apt example which can always be remembered at any point of time. So it was indeed a great opportunity to listen to you. I, on behalf of the Ahmedabad branch and all participants, express sincere gratitude and thanks to you for such a wonderful talk on the subject.